Hey guys, and welcome to the Buying Tampa Bay podcast. Chase Clark here with my co-host Peter Murphy this morning. Hey, good morning, y'all. Hey, today we want to give you a quick market update. Uh, Probably many of y'all in the Tampa Bay area have recently seen uh, stories on the news about the real estate market. Uh, It's a popular thing to talk about these days, especially with interest rates on the rise and the market seeming to slow a little bit beyond what we've been used to for the past 24 months during the pandemic period. But I um, wanted to update you with, a, with some of the actual figures and facts that are going on with the real estate market right now. Some of the news agencies are painting this with kind of a broad brush and painting kind of a negative light on the market right now. We've got high interest rates. We've got prices that have kind of stabilized and maybe even fallen slightly in some areas. And we've got a slowdown in the number of transactions going on right now. But if you look at the statistics right now that are published by GTAR, Year to date, we're still up 15% in home values. And so I'd say we're doing pretty good for 2022. Um, it, it's not the projected you know, 18 to 20% we thought we might get, and it may even fall a little bit before the end of the year, but 15 is holding strong and it looks pretty good right now. From an inventory standpoint, you know, inventory is actually a little bit below what it was pre-pandemic. We're sitting at about 8,000 available units right now compared to 10,000 that we were running in September of 2019. And so not quite as many units out there right now. And uh, I think that's going to lead to, you know, pretty good stabilization of housing values. Um, You know, that's indicative of of what we're seeing right now with the slowdown in transactions because of higher interest rates and higher ownership costs. But as Many people out there now that seem to know what they're talking about, along with Fannie Mae are predicting, we're hoping to see rates back down in that 5% range, hopefully by the late spring. So all that's kind of going into this kind of crystal ball as to, okay, where's the housing market going right now? But I don't think there's any reason to panic. Uh, No need to think that the sky is falling or that prices are going to precipitously drop on us here. Tampa Bay's resilient. We've got a really strong housing market. And I think the stats are are definitely proving that out. Yeah, there's there's a lot of anomalies in the market. There have been a lot of anomalies in the market for the past few years. And there certainly are not a lot of anomalies now. I mean, when you think about what we've just come out of and that pandemic uh, market where, where we had all kinds of, of surges in demand for homes here in Florida, we had that really ate into our supply. We're coming out of that now, we're well beyond it, and we're seeing return to normalization in a lot of ways. We're seeing a pullback in the very aggressive prices that people were paying to buy up Florida homes because they were aspiring to get out of their lockdown economies. And we see a freeing up of the supply chains ever so slightly. We certainly see more builder inventory coming online. So supplies are coming up a little bit, and that's leading to a softening in average sale prices. But if we compare that to what was going on prior to the pandemic, Chase, as you already mentioned, we're well above where we were pre-pandemic. Now, I know that's like, well, three years ago almost, if we go back to 2019, but it's very important to smooth out some of these bumps and troughs in market trends and see what our straight line trajectory is. You know, we've said it many times on this show already, you don't lose, it's never a bad time to buy a home, but there often is a really bad time to sell a home. And so if you bought a home at pandemic peak pricing and you're going out to try and sell it right now, you're going to take a loss. But if you hold that product long enough for the market to balance itself out and and once again begin its trajectory of recovery, you're probably going to do fine. Keeping in mind that the economy, housing market is a very long time horizon, a long commitment for you. Stay in, stay involved, and you should just do you should do just fine, even if you bought at some of those pre-pandemic levels. But do remember, you've got to smooth out some of those peaks that we've seen at pandemic uh, in the pandemic market in order to have a really healthy understanding of what's going on with home prices right now. Yeah, and so for sellers out there right now, um, unfortunate that you didn't sell maybe six or 12 or 15 months ago because you would have had more buyers in the market and maybe stiffer competition for your home back when homes were selling above appraisal price and interest rates were low, okay? But so now what you're looking at is maybe less buyers in the market, you know, kind of waiting to see what interest rates do. You may have to give away some concessions. You may have to come off your price a little bit. But for buyers right now, great time to take advantage of this situation. 
great time to to take advantage of a time where there's less competition for some of these homes than there has been in the prior two year period. Also, realize that you may be paying a higher interest rate right now at like six and three quarters or so, but you'll probably save enough money now buying the home to be able to afford to refinance six, 12 months from now when rates come back down and bring your monthly payment down several hundred dollars a month. So consider that when you're looking now, don't be scared of the interest rate. If you can afford the loan and afford to buy, this may be a great time for you to buy. And especially with new home builders out there giving away huge incentives for you to buy their product. Yeah, that's a great point. I think we also need to remember what we're hearing a lot of right now and how how the whole iBuyer uh, losses and the losses due to institute real estate uh, companies in general and new construction companies. We're hearing a lot of news about how bad their stock is doing and how much companies like Zillow and Offerpad and Open Door and Redfin have lost. I mean, the losses that these companies are reporting are astronomical. They're right on par with the losses that we're seeing from FTX's collapse. Almost a billion dollars in some cases, hundreds of million dollars from the average iBuyer player. These are the kind of write downs and losses they're taking right now because of their ill advised entrance into the iBuyer marketplace. And if you don't know what that is, let me explain to you really quickly what folks were doing. Many of these large tech based real estate companies were putting offers on homes sight unseen based upon a highly appreciating marketplace. Their computers were generating offer prices, plugging those offer prices into contracts, blasting those contracts out to buyers. They were buying homes, or sorry, I should say sellers. They were buying homes with estimates of what it would cost to fix them up. Those estimates were dra drastically wrong in lots of cases because we were in the pandemic marketplace and costs were way up for rehab and renovation. So they were way under estimating the cost to make homes ready. And they were projecting solid continual growth in home price appreciation, two things that they are way off on. And so Zillow reported recently that it lost an average of $25,000 on every home that it purchased with its iBuyer model. And what you could almost guarantee is that's because they bid out way too uh, optimistically on what rehab would cost. And they pegged way too high a projection on where that home would finally sell. So once they spent the money to rehab it to market standard and then the market softened and they had to sell it, they were losing out to the tune of $25,000 per home. Anyone who stopped their iBuyer model right now has had to dump their inventory. And interestingly, what they have not done is dump it on the retail market because every one of them recognizes that if they go dump these on MLS, the market will come way down faster. So instead of what of that, what they've done, of course, that would hurt them even more and their agents. So what they've done is they've sold these this product in tranches to their Wall Street investor buddies who own single family, who own portfolios of single family rental homes. And so Wall Street has done really well buying up these homes now at markdown prices from the I buyers. That's going to really help keep this product from impacting uh, average home sales that we see hitting. MLSs and it's good. And so really happy that that whole buyer reality exists out there, but you can't escape the negative drumbeat of that news right now. And all of it's kind of painted a little bit of a pall over the housing market. What we want to say is that what's happened in the iBuyer marketplace should not scare the average home owner dramatically. That is a failed attempt by tech companies to replace what really only a sensible on the ground person can do by looking at homes and determining with clarity what they're actually worth and what it will cost to renovate them so they can really thoroughly understand their profit potential. Yeah, you know, that's another really good reminder about real estate being local, right? You've got national companies, you've got big builders that are backed by Wall Street, publicly traded companies out here making macroeconomic decisions on the national level for local markets like Tampa Bay, right? And when they do that, it typically doesn't work out so well for them because every real estate market is local. It requires boots on the ground, eyes on the prize. And that's just something that some of these national, especially the I buyers, have failed to do. And so when we think about local markets, one thing in, in the, the main theme of our podcast today is going to be talking about something very local to Florida and something that impacts the Tampa Bay region greatly because of our coastline. 
And that is a condo law that went into effect back in May of 22. And with all the noise about the real estate market and the excitement around it and all the, you know, the high price rises and now the interest rate rise and the slowdown and all that, you may have missed that this law went into effect. And you may not recall that even back on June 24th, 2021 in South Florida, that the Champlain Tower South condo building collapsed. It was a 12 story condo tower in Surfside, Florida, that at one o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden had a structural failure and partially collapsed to the ground, killing 98 people. And this was a building built in 1981. So, you know, 40, 40 years old when it, when it collapsed. And it was part of a three tower complex down there in South Florida. And, you know, based on the investigation they did, they tried to determine, okay, what in the world caused a reinforced structural concrete building to collapse unexpectedly to the ground like this. There were some issues under the pool deck in the parking garage, but this is the first and only building collapse like this that we know of in the state of Florida. It hasn't happened before that, that we're aware of. There have been other collapses of things around the world, but for a 40 year old reinforced concrete 12 story condo tower to come to the ground is an anomaly. And so we still don't know exactly why this happened, but it was so tragic that it caused this knee jerk reaction. And what the legislature in Florida has done is now passed a law imposing all kinds of regulations and restrictions and inspection requirements on condo towers here in the state of Florida. You know, it's, it's a shocking story, Chase. I mean, I'm just listening to you recount it is one of those things that kind of like hits everyone at the core, right? Here's a building that's 40 years old and it collapses while people are sleeping in it at night, right? And a hundred people, almost a hundred people, just their lives are gone, right? That is the kind of story that horror movies are made out of. Yeah. And everyone wants to be able to trace a chain of events that led to something truly cataclysmic like that happening. And everyone wants to pinpoint exactly why it happened and and also put in plans that put in place plans that would prevent something like that from ever happening in the future. And you completely understand the drive to do that because if it was my family member, if it was me that suffered from that kind of loss, I would want folks to truly understand it too and to take precautions from it happening again. But we, like you said, we don't know the full reasons why this happened. And what often happens in times like this is that politicians rush to make legislative changes so that they can, well, with their, with their understanding of why something happened. And as time tends to do, more is uncovered for why that building might have collapsed. And so what we saw from many of the preliminary reports is that the constant barrage of salt water and seawater at the foundational structures of this building particularly with the exposed rebar elements that are often found in concrete buildings, that that salt water just corroded them, caused all kinds of rust and degradation of both the concrete and the rebars, which just took away its structural, structural integ integrity so that over time that building collapsed. And that has kind of led way to all kinds of, of laws that are, that are looking at those kinds of elements, the exposed, the structural challenges, the things that salt water does to buildings. But there's also a very important question in all of this, and that is, you know, how long does a building actually last, right? Here's some questions that we have no idea of the answer of because we live in a relatively new construction economy. You know, people will say that concrete and concrete buildings and bridges last 50 years and much of our infrastructure around our country is failing now or considered failing because it's well in excess of 50 years old. That's why we have bridge collapses over rivers. It's why we have all kinds of road failures right now. It's why we have such a need for concrete and reinforcement all around our country because our transportation grid is aging and we really don't know what the failure of our buildings and transportation grids is going to look like. So we're trying to do everything we can to get ahead of catastrophes like this. Hence the Senate Bill 4D, as you just mentioned. Yeah, that's an interesting thing to point out because, you know, I think we, we look at, at buildings in New York City where we started building skyscrapers in the 20s, right? And some of these buildings are approaching 100 years old. 
and we haven't heard about any kind of material you know defects or structural issues with these buildings um, they haven't collapsed to the ground they're twice as old as the champlain tower building was and yet buildings like champlain towers of 12 stories uh, condo buildings along the coast of florida they started to proliferate in the 60s and so they're not that old in florida you know they're they're 60 years old at this point uh, most of the oldest ones um all of them built in some kind of a reinforced concrete you know type construction but last sunday on 60 minutes it was interesting 60 minutes highlighted this story to bring it back to light now you know over about a year and a half since it it actually collapsed and the the lead investigator for the federal government who is involved in this now came on and said it's going to be two more years until the investigation is complete and we had, can draw any kind of conclusions as to why this happened. And so fear of it happening again is definitely the main driver, I think, behind the need to act, right? And I think that's why people thought we gotta do something, right? We cannot let this happen again. And now we have Senate Bill 4D um, went into effect, you know, like we said, you know, this past May, and really puts in place a lot of requirements on condo buildings that are three stories or more in the state of Florida and starts to have major impacts on what they're required to do from an inspection, from a reserve funding standpoint, and from a repair standpoint, starting in December of 2024 as the first deadline for some of these things to happen. And so when we look out on that, we've got two years now to figure out as condo associations, if we are over three stories, we're within three miles of the coastline, or if we're just, I think in general, condos over three stories are required to do certain things. And there's a second set of requirements for condos over three stories that are within three miles of the coastline. Um, you've got to figure out, okay, how do we get these things done? Who do we need to hire? How much is it going to cost? And what's the impact going to be on our owners? Right. And, and the legislation itself really digs into inspections. That's the, where it all starts. There is now an obligation on any of the properties that fall within this rather broad dragnet to inspect their property thoroughly and make sure that there are none of these structu potential structural issues that we think might have contributed to the collapse of Surfside, collapse in Surfside. So, inspections are going to be critical and key but the challenge is of course is that we really don't know what these inspections should fully entail nor do we know for sure if we have the inspective force to execute the inspections or the skill sets in our inspectors to truly understand to truly dig in get behind the curtain on these condos structurally and figure out if they're compromised in some kind of way i mean truly how does an inspector go in to verify the structural integrity of the rebar inside the foundation of a condominium tower? They're asking, first of all, that an inspector eyeballs the building to determine if there is anything that raises concern to them. So imagine the subjective standards that could be employed by all kinds of different eyeball inspections of a building. You know, and let's let's not forget. These buildings of all kinds of different facades, stuccos, landscapes, gr uh, gravel and ground covers that are covering over all kinds of things that you probably can't see with your eyeball to know for sure that that, pro that building might have an issue. And so, my, I can just see all kinds of people trying to cover their tails by saying, yeah, phase one, this is, this is the eyeball inspection, which is phase one of these inspections. Phase one's a fail for me. I saw a couple of things that are going to be concerning. So we really need to start digging deeper and go phase two and start doing some borings and probings and really understand what's happening there. I can almost see that happening almost without exception where people elevate an inspection to that next round of, of uh, detail to avoid any kind of liability that would arise from a failed eyeball test, which has to be immense, Chase. Well, so it's also of no surprise to us here in Florida with the lack of, you know, tort reform that's gone on that when you go out to Google this, you know, SB4D, the majority of the websites that are providing information and advice on this are attorneys, right? And so, you know, of course, attorneys are going to try and stick their foot in the door on this and get involved in some way to escalate the cost to everyone involved. But 
my question is, you know, haven't these inspections already been going on? I mean, come on, an eyeball test, right? So we own a beachfront condo in Indian Rocks Beach, right? It's a four-story building. The first floor is parking, and then you have three stories of living space above. It's only 14 units, right? It's on a very narrow strip of land there called the Narrows and Indian Rocks with water on both sides. I mean, there's literally water within 30 yards of the front and the back of the building. It's sitting on a tiny little piece of a sandbar, right? You know, wouldn't you expect that that kind of a building, number one, might have structural issues over time? Uh, but number two, if it was currently having issues, wouldn't they be readily visible to everyone that goes there? Wouldn't people be raising their hands and say, whoa, hold on. I see cracks in the concrete. I see exposed rebar. I see things falling apart. You know, is it? Wouldn't that be a normal eye test? I would think that would qualify, right? And the problem probably is that every single one of those structures has the kinds of problems you're describing. Here in one unit, there might be a railing that's loose. Here in another unit, there's a corner on a balcony that's snapped off due to wear and tear, and a little bit of rebar is exposed. Right? Is that loose railing indicative of structural failure of the building? Is the exposed rebar indicative of structural failure of the building? We don't know. And no engineer is going to put his name and seal on the line to say that building is fine because he's going to see those little things and say, but what if it isn't? What if that is the beginning of something great? I don't want to lose my license by passing that in phase one of my round of inspections. You've got to go to phase two now and begin to that full invasive inspection of the property. And my goodness, that's going to happen to every single condo building if this legislation is is kept in its current form. Yeah, so hopefully this is like other legislation that we've seen, and I, I didn't read all the fine print, but hopefully we don't have a situation where, you know, you've got to hire either a licensed architect or a licensed engineer to come do this inspection. That's part of the law. Hopefully it's not a situation where this architect or engineer is in bed with a structural building company who stands to profit greatly from doing invasive boring and sampling of your structure. Um, because that would pr present all kinds of conflicts of interest and pad the pockets of all kinds of people in an adverse way here and not really accomplish the intended purpose. Unfortunately, we, we've seen that before, right? We've seen this with insurance and roofing. We've seen this with the sinkhole issues that have happened over the past 20 years. And hopefully this doesn't become one of those things for the state of Florida. But is it reasonable that the legislature has drawn the line at 25 years, right? For a, a coastal condo, something within three miles of the coast and on its 25th birthday, it needs an inspection. And then it needs one every 10 years after that, right? You know, I look at that and I'm like, okay, hey, that's not too bad, right? Ha have the place inspected, you know, after 25 years. And then every 10 years after that, you know, kind of seems reasonable to me. I don't know. It, well, it does, right? Because everyone wants to inspect a property. Everyone wants to like, ha like frequently make sure that we're not going to be getting ourselves into a, a surfside type collapse. The problem is that we don't know what qualifies as structural demise or structural undermining, the kind of thing that would lead to a collapse of a structure like what we saw in Surfside. So we might see problems emerging and crackings and stuff, but then what do we do with that information? Do we then say, sorry, that building is well condemned. You pretty much can't move forward with it unless you make all of these repairs. And we don't know yet the cost of fixing some of these problems, right? It could be just extreme. It could be extreme uh, in the nature of, you know, almost the cost of new construction of that building to begin with if we're looking at really reinforcing and rebuilding some of the structural elements of it. So by imposing upon the communities this standard, which will require them to make these repairs, I don't know how that works out financially for those who own these units. If at 25 years old, they're looking at the potential cost of major structural modifications to the property. Now, if life and limb are on the line, you can understand why someone would ask them to do that because it's not just their family at risk. It's their guests, if they're using it as a short-term rental, it's everyone who lives around them. But we are looking at a situation here that has a sky is the limit exposure for people who own within these condo towers. And financially, I don't know how that can be a, picked, a recipe for solvency 
for people who own it. Yeah, and you know, you know, there's a couple issues at play, right? And, and one is simply, do we have enough architects and engineers in the state of Florida available to get all of these inspections done? Right. I mean, last time I checked, I don't know any architects or engineers that are sitting around twiddling their thumbs thinking, man, I wish someone would call me to inspect a condo building today. I mean, these people are busy. We got a lot of stuff going on here in Florida. There's a lot of construction, a lot of land development with 800 people a day still moving to this state. These professionals are very busy. And so where can we find slack in these professions to pick up this additional workload that's going to be required? And then on top of that, one thing to consider is, you know, right now, I think the estimate for what a phase one just visual inspection will cost is somewhere between four and six thousand dollars for a, a small condo building like our like our 14 unit building. Right. Four to six thousand dollars for that building. That's a little over four hundred dollars per owner that they would have to contribute just to get the inspection done, not to account for any additional repairs that need to be made, a phase two study or anything beyond that. For us in our current situation, that's about a 5% increase to our monthly condo dues. Just that one line item, a 5% increase on top of all the inflationary increases that we've experienced in things like pool care and lawn service and all of that over the past two years. So it may seem like a small number in the big scheme of things, but for the individual condo owner, it could be a 5% increase in their monthly dues payment. Right, and that's assuming we can find the person, the professional to do the inspection. And then that four to $6,000 holds because listen, I, what we know for sure is that if we have a shortage of providers of this service, that cost is simply going to go up, right? Because there's not, because you're gonna lead to a, a, a supply shortage, which will push pricing up for this service to be completed. And as you already mentioned, it doesn't include the repairs that absolutely will come out of every one of these inspections, just as a cover your rear end uh, requirement that these inspectors are going to put on themselves. So we are looking at big impacts to association, to, to monthly dues. And for people who are living in these homes, who, who have made financial decisions to buy into these communities based upon the economic production level of these properties, or for people who have been living there a long time and maybe are on fixed income, because you know Florida hasn't always what the West Coast of Florida, Florida in general, hasn't always been the mecca for the rich. This has been a place of affordable beach access, and many of the people who have lived here for thirty and forty and fifty years paid a small amount of money to get onto the beach, and their dues have remained fairly low. A tripling, a quadrupling of dues, which we could well see if that's what's required for these inspections, will literally put these people out of their homes, will literally force investors out of the product because they didn't invest with the expectation of a 4x increase in HOA fees in mind. That will cause some real displacement on a lot of owners and investors alike. And I don't know how the marketplace will react specifically to that. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's estimated that there are over 900,000 condo units in Florida that are over 30 years old right now. 900,000 units just in the state of Florida with, I think, uh, was it 3 million residents living in these condos. So this is a big impact for a lot of people in this state. You know, one thing to consider too is that when you look at a condo association or a homeowners association budget, right? There's two components to the budget. One is operating and one is reserve, right? So the operating budget typically covers operational items that recur, you know, every month or every so often, right? You've got things in there like lawn service, pool service, um, elevator maintenance, uh, fire system maintenance, cleaning staff, stuff like that. That The, the manager's, uh, you know, salary that you pay them every month, legal reporting, all that kind of stuff that happens on some kind of a recurring basis. But then you've got the reserve component, right? And the reserve component is where you're stashing away money every month so that you have a rainy day fund for when major items need to be replaced or repaired. Like if you need to replace the roof or you need to paint the building or you need to replace the pool equipment or things like that. You know, and so every HOA has got an operating component and a reserve component. And the monthly dues that every owner pays 
Part of it goes to the operational fund and part of it goes to the reserve fund. And typically, you know, in a, in a condo building like the one that, that, that we have on the beach, our reserves are funding things like roof, painting, railings on balconies, uh, pool equipment, pool deck, um, elevator replacement and repair, things like that, right? Major structural components. But we've never had a reserve requirement for something like the foundation, right? I mean, who's reserving money to replace your foundation? I mean, just from a common sense perspective, you might think if you have a foundation failure, it's beyond repair. Like, why would you reserve money for that, you know? But that's part of this new structural integrity reserve study that's going to be required as part of this new Senate bill. And so what the state legislature is saying is, look, we're glad you've been reserving for things all along, but here are some required items now that you must reserve for, and you're required to have a qualified person do a study every year to make sure that you have the right reserve amounts in place for these elements of your building. And it includes things like the roof, which we've normally been reserving for, but now we're adding things like load-bearing walls, structural flooring, foundation, fireproofing, uh, fire protection systems have usually been in there, but things like plumbing, so like sewer lines, supply lines, and any feature with a deferred maintenance or replacement cost that exceeds $10,000, right? That could be a lot of things in a condo building. Well, and historically, condo associations and their boards of directors were given some leniency on whether or not they had to fully fund reserves. So they understood already that they needed to be funding and setting aside money for some of these strategic repairs, but they made choices to partially fund some of those replacements. And instead, if the inevitability of replacing the roof came up and there weren't sufficient reserves for that, they would do a special assessment to owners of that community to replace the roof. And that way they would kind of bridge their budget or their reserve funding shortfall. This new legislation requires that HOAs no longer short fund reserves. They must fully fund all their reserves. And of course, then it puts upon them the onus that they actually have to spend the money when it's determined that those things need to be replaced. Now, practically speaking as a homeowner, what I know is this, my roof might be a 20 year roof on my house. And at the end of that 20 year period, it might or might not need to be replaced. It might be able to be repaired. I might be able to impose repairs for the next 10 or 15 years on that roof because it won't fail in time. But if instead I am required to fully fund for a replacement and spend it, imagine the level of forced waste that we put upon communities as they rush to spend all the reserves they've been fully funding and uh, in order to comply with this law. Imagine what that's going to do to roofers who are like, this is gravy. We can go ahead and just budget on every 20 years replacing the roof on every condo community in Florida. Talk about a huge impact on pricing. Talk about a real marketplace inefficiency that's being put upon us, not by actual need, but by legislation and protective legislation. These kinds of things, Chase, never work out in the long term. They are always essentially attacks on common sense and an imposition of a requirement that does not work for every building. Well, it'll be interesting to see too, you know, when you have your engineer come in and do your visual inspection for phase one, and he says, hey, look, when you go to do your reserves, you need to reserve a half a million dollars for your foundation over the next 50 years, right? Now that, that may not sound like a lot of money, but an extra $10,000 a year for the next 50 years going into reserves is a lot of money per owner on a monthly basis, right? And you, you start adding on all the items, load-bearing walls, structural flooring, like where will these numbers take us? We, we, we know one thing for sure, as condo dues rise, the buyer pool for your condo becomes smaller because it drives the price down or it drives out buyers who can't afford to pay that high monthly requirement, right? And so that's what all co current condo owners are, are really kind of got some apprehension right now about what the real impact of this bill is going to be from a financial standpoint. And so you've seen over the past six months, quite a few people exit the market. 
And whether they were doing that strategically because of this or trying to take advantage of, of a, um, a high price, um, high buyer volume kind of market, um, that, that remains to be seen. But this is definitely something that's going to have a financial impact on owners, probably for the worse when it comes to condo values and affordability. Well, inevitably it will, right? Because this is going to increase the total cost of owning that home dramatically. And it's going to put on the cost of your condo and a big question mark on what it's actually going to cost in the long term to own that structure. Today, you might look at some dues and feel like, hey, these dues are affordable. But should my 10-year condo study come back in phase two and require structural rebuilding? I mean, by the way, we have no idea what that actually costs. We don't rebuild foundations on multi-story towers very often. They use, that does not, that's not usually a cost that we understand clearly. And so if every owner in there is exposed to this astronomical cost potential at some regular junction in the future, what incentive does any owner have to buy that building? A portion of the share of cost in that building because they'll be forced by everyone else and by this legislation to make this change. See, when you're the single owner of a multi-tower, let's say you own it all, you own all the units in it or your house is multi-story, you can make the determination on your own whether or not you want to spend the money for those kinds of deferred maintenance requirements. And often you have them, right? Every house has them. And every time you buy a house, you find something that should have been fixed 10 years ago and wasn't because, well, it was too expensive for the homeowner to fix it. So they patched it, right? So you're going to see more and more instances of single corporate owner structures because they're simply not going to be able to afford the cost that's going to be required of them with multiple owners enforcing this kind of action upon them. That will be a negative for the market in general because every person has been able to have a piece of the beachfront dream in Florida. Your own little bit of, of oceanfront property you've been able to afford because you could buy into a condo tower. Think going forward, only corporate owners of these buildings who lease them out as rentals and make whatever decisions they want and are not held accountable to these same standards because they're single owner structures. That will very much impact the average person, well, I guess to live on the beach, you got to be slightly above average anyway, I'm thinking, but it'll impact that above average person's ability to be able to get in on that beachfront lifestyle. That's not going to be a good thing for the market in general. Yeah, you know, people that own any type of real estate near or on the coast have been beaten up pretty good over the last couple of years, uh, specifically just by insurance, you know, the cost of flood insurance, the cost of building insurance, you know, rising precipitously over the last few years has really put a dent in a lot of these condo associations budgets to begin with. Add on to that the rising inflationary cost of just goods and services required to keep these things functional and operational. And now the additional reserve requirements that may be you know, implemented within the next 24 months on these buildings. And it's been a tough go for condo owners. And I guess we'll see what happens with how these costs trickle down. You know, will people that rent their units out now or rents going up 30%, yeah, they've got to cover the cost somehow, right? Are people going to start selling off and vacating because they can no longer afford to live in their condo? I think we're going to see some of that too. Um, will some of the old condo buildings be bought out by developers and torn down and be redeveloped with newer buildings um, that aren't subject to some of these requirements? You know, yeah, I mean, I think we're already seeing some of that in South Florida. Um, a news story this week I watched uh, highlighted two towers that were built in the 60s that have recently been bought by um, overseas companies coming in to tear them down and, and put up 30 story glass and steel structures, you know. And uh, so we're going to get some beautiful buildings out of this. Maybe that's the, uh, the upside to it. But for the individual owners, I think there's going to be a, a tough road to hoe unless something changes with this legislation. And that's really what you've got to hope for. I mean, two things. Of course, the actual longevity of these properties, of these structures, was always a question mark to begin with. We built beautiful towers on the beach, not knowing what the actual implications would be on 60-year-old construction standards, right? From the elements, from the constant barrage of tropical storms, from the winds that are laden with salt driving up against these structures. And there's a little bit of hubris every time someone goes to build a property because we're like, this will last forever. But of course, this is a great reminder that nothing we do lasts forever. 
And we probably need to make contingency plans to protect against the inevitable demise of anything that's man-made. That's one side of the issue. And so we're being humbled a little bit by this surfside collapse to know that our works are pretty ephemeral, right? But on the other side of that, I think our legislators need to be equally humble. They're trying to push down some laws to help us solve a problem that we don't know the real reason why it happened. And what we really will likely see here, by the way, a lot of these legislatures own beachfront properties themselves. They're going to experience what the cost of insurance is going to be as, as these standards are imposed. And their HOAs, how that's going to drive up costs of ownership. And when everyone starts seeing the real impact of the costs here, I expect there will likely be some modification to this legislation to bring some more sensibility to these standards, especially once the federal investigation of the collapse becomes clear and we can really see what caused the problem. Then let's craft good legislation that solves the problem that's being identified and not be too hasty. But the outcome will likely be there will be some elements of this that are overturned. But on the other side, we will continue to see questions and uncertainty surrounding this sector in the marketplace as long as we're dealing with things that are beyond our knowledge base and outside of our control. And certainly that is the weather and the impact beachfront living has on how we're building today. Yeah, one thing in my mind, it'd be interesting to see how the insurance industry ends up impacting some of these things. I could foresee a possibility where um, insurance gets involved and condo associations end up buying riders to their policies or some type of additional insurance coverage possibly to be able to forego the actual funding of the reserves. Um, because if you look at the probability of any of these things happening, you know, again, we've talked about Champlain Towers, first building we've ever seen catastrophically collapse on the coast here in Florida, despite the fact that it's 40 years, it was 40 years old, built well before hurricane standards, subject to the pounding of the environment and beachfront conditions and all of that, still the only one. And so as insurance companies start to look at the actuarial, you know, analysis of this outcome actually happening, I would love to believe that they will step in and start to provide coverage in some way, shape, or form that will prevent associations from having to outlay huge amounts of cash every year into reserve funds. And if that happens, that could be a way for us to mitigate some of this affordability issues if the premiums obviously make sense. But uh, we've got to have something like that happen, I think, some kind of intervention or mitigation of the actual cash requirement to be able to maintain some level of affordability. Yeah, yeah, Chase, but you know, like you said, never underestimate the ingenuity of the American mind, right? Here's a problem that seems like, wow, it could have some real serious ramifications on a big sector of our market, a big driver of our economy. But inevitably what happens when these sorts of things arise is that some entrepreneur comes out of the woodworks with a technology that helps you do this in a low cost fashion. And that man or woman is going to become extremely rich because we're going to have all kinds of demand for their products. And the insurance sector, which is always looking for a new market sector to enter, will probably begin selling some kind of insurance product. And of course, attorneys, unless there's tort reform, will try to get their piece of the pie too. But we're going to see entrepreneurial developments that will help us tackle some of these requirements. And probably at the end of the day, we're all going to be much better off for it because I don't want to live in a tower that's going to collapse. I don't want to live under the constant fear that my building might slip out from underneath me while I'm sleeping in it. I truly want someone to develop a fantastic product that lets them do uh, wall penetrating, ultrasonic, or uh, investigative, um, investigative research without compromising the structure or costing me a fortune. I want that technology. I might try to invent that technology right now and sell it to these condos so that we can continue to live safely and happily in our little bit of Florida tropical paradise. I hope that emerges. I have no doubt that it'll emerge, but our first reaction is legislative. And that's what we're getting ready to deal with over the next couple of years. Chase, I think one of the things you said I've heard frequently now, and that's gonna be that many associations, the owners within those associations will make the decisions as a collective to sell out. And some of these are a lot smaller associations. So bringing together 13 or 14 owners to make a single decision to all sell their units to the market or to a developer, 
might be the emergence of some very interesting, some very beautiful, and some very progressive developments around our coastlines. And that's a great way, I think, for people to see a fulfillment in their investment on the beach. Sell out of that. Recognize the gains that are yours now after 20 or 30 years of good ownership and enjoy the fruits of your wise investment. I could see that happening often in the days ahead. Yeah, maybe even trade up into a unit in the new building. Hey, that's a good idea. You get like at least another hundred years, right, of solvency. Exactly. <laughs> a lack you of know, fear. It's funny too, because one of the hypotheses about the collapse of this building is construction standards, right? that were occurring on a new construction project right next door to the Champlain Tower that collapsed. And if you've ever watched these skyscrapers go up, the first thing that happens is these massive cranes come in and they pound these giant reinforced concrete pillars into the ground. You've probably seen this with bridge construction or, or major, major you know, skyscraper construction. And the pounding of these things into the ground over and over again was jarring this building. They've got testimony from occupants of the Champlain Towers about how the, the floors would shake and vibrate every day for months on end as they're driving these pilings into the ground. And so uh, one other thing that might come out of this, like you're saying, is innovation and new building construction. Maybe we don't need to be pounding the ground that hard, you know, because it's leading to the deterioration or rapid accelerated deterioration of buildings around us. Maybe there's a better way. I'm sure there is, and I'm sure we'll figure it out. Well, this has been a really interesting episode. I mean, I think what we what we kind of encounter as we dig into these problems, these failures of big companies, the correction of marketplaces, the collapsing of towers and the tragic loss of life that accompanies them is the emergence of stronger and better and more resourceful uh, entrepreneurs and more resourceful businesses. And all of this is really good for the economy. It comes at a tremendous cost. And you know, we continue to pray for the people who've been affected by these kinds of disasters. But as we look ahead, what we can be sure of is that the market will figure out better ways to build, to build safely, to develop strong tech-based real estate companies that don't have to lose billions of dollars when the market turns, but instead are able to see around the corner in ways to prevent that kind of investor loss. All of these things accrue to our knowledge and let us be better and more resourceful real estate investors or owners. And that is a really, really good thing. Yeah, events like this always create opportunity. Um, and there's opportunity for improvement on all fronts. And there's opportunities for, for investors to enter the market as you know, we're all seeking to buy our piece of Tampa Bay. You know, no better piece of Tampa Bay to buy than one that's right on the beach right now. That's right. Chase, Chase, you and I work together at Home Prop and we have all kinds of insight into these kinds of matters. We think that's what makes a difference for Home Prop uh, customers that your professionals at our organization understand some of these deals and are able to bring some of these, uh, some of this mindset to play when you're making good investments in the Bay Area, beachfront property or non-beachfront property. It's all Florida paradise. And so, hey, where can they go to learn more about us, Chase? Well, check us out on homeprop.com and continue uh, listening to our podcast. You can find it on Spotify or any other major podcast platform. Great stuff. Thanks a lot for listening, guys. Peter out. All right. Thanks, Peter.